is the Jeep Wrangler JKU reliable? Uh, how has it held up for me over four years of ownership, having driven and wheeled this thing from coast to coast, um, and looking at it compared to some of the other great off-road platforms out there, how does it stack up against the competition? That's where we're headed today. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, I'm Caleb. Welcome to 4 by Trail. Uh, it's so awesome having the Wrangler out again today. It's been a little while. Uh, we actually just hopped back in it because it's a little windy today. I want to make sure the audio comes through clear for you guys, but we'll be showing some B-roll throughout this video so you'll get a chance to see more than just the inside of the Jeep here. Uh, but a lot of you have been asking, man, Caleb, what's up with the Wrangler? You know, why uh, has it not been featured lately? Is it out of commission? Did you sell it? Like, what's going on? So today I'm going to talk about some of the reasons um, why you haven't seen as much of it lately. It's needed some maintenance, and uh, I'm going to be given some sort of the cost of long-term ownership uh, with this thing and some things you might may or, not, may or may not be aware of when it comes to maintaining a Wrangler JKU over the long run. Um, so we're going to be looking at that today. I've owned this thing for four years, which is crazy. Uh, but we also love to feature a variety of um, off-road and adventure content here on the channel. So uh, we've been featuring our Lexus GX470 a little bit more lately. That's a newer vehicle, a newer build that we uh, have done and enjoyed, you know, off-roading around Colorado and, and here in Arizona a little bit, uh, just getting started with, with that thing. And then also the new Gladiator build that is kicking off hopefully in a couple of weeks. My buddy Jim and I will dive into that in his shop, and we're super pumped. That thing's going to be such a fun build, a one-ton axle swap, long-arm suspension, uh, it's just going to be a beast, and we're excited to bring you along and do some live updates uh, from the shop and just have some fun uh, with that build together with you guys. So super pumped for that. Also, the Opus 15 camper uh, that has made getting off grid with our family so much nicer. We've got a, another trip coming up uh, with that thing, hopefully here soon, to see some of the fall colors up in northern Arizona. So excited to bring you guys along for that as well. So just we like to do a lot of different content here on the channel. But I know there's a lot of Wrangler fans out there. Today we're going to be diving into all things Wrangler JKU and talking about some of the cost of long-term ownership. Now I've done a full rig walk around of this Wrangler and going into detail on the build and what I've done to it in another video. I'll leave a link to that video down below for you to check out. Uh, but I think for the purposes of this video, it's important to know it's a 2014 and as it sits right now, it's got 72,000 miles on it. Now I purchased it about four years ago with 9,000 miles. So most of those miles I've put on it myself. In that time, I've wheeled this thing all over. It's done the Rim Rocker Trail from Colorado to Utah. Um, it's been to Moab twice. I've hit most of the trails in southwestern Colorado in the San Juan Mountains, um, in the Midwest, Missouri, and Indiana, on the West Coast, Southern California, out in the Anza Borrego, and quite a few places here in our home state of Arizona. So it's covered some miles both on and off road. And I think it's important to note uh, it's never left me stranded. Uh, on the trail or on the road. None of the issues we're going to be talking about today, the repairs, the maintenance, none of that has ended a trip or left me on the side of the highway, nothing like that. It's always gotten me home, which uh, I think is worth noting. All right, so let's dive into what I've had to repair and replace, and then we'll talk about some of the stuff that's actually held up super well. Starting off, something I was not expecting uh, that happened early on in my ownership uh, with really low miles still on the Jeep, um, the oil filter housing, the engine oil filter housing cracked from being over tightened. And uh, it's a plastic housing that's right at the top of the engine. It goes into the center of the engine. You have to pull the top end off to replace it. And it's really easy to over tighten that thing because it's primarily made of plastic. And there's a built in uh, oil cooler into that thing as well. So it's a pretty intricate piece, not super expensive. And I did the maintenance my, or the repair myself uh, with my dad. And so we saved some money there. But if you were to take that in, it's pretty invasive uh, and it would definitely cost a good chunk of money to have that work done yourself. It's kind of a silly thing. It should be made better than that. It shouldn't be made primarily of plastic um, and the way it's designed, you shouldn't be able to crack it so easily by over tightening, um, but it's something to be aware of. I've also had to replace the thermostat, the engine thermostat twice. Um, first time due to like it threw an engine code and uh, it was failing. The other time that was around probably 65,000 miles or so. The other time was uh, just recently when I was having some other work done that I'll talk about in a second. And they said, yeah, that thermostat's actually leaking. So 
I may not have tightened it down enough, um, but I have a feeling those thermostats might just be a little finicky on this uh, Pentastar engine, so something to be aware of. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to replace, and it's a cheap part. Uh, you can do it in an evening in your garage very easily, so uh, it's not a big deal, but it is something to be aware of. Something that is a big deal um, that I recently did, and that's this is what really took the Jeep out of commission for a little bit, um, was the classic Pentastar lifter knock or valve lash adjuster knock. It's that tick, 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 tick that you're hearing in this clip right here. Now, if you've owned a Wrangler or really any of the vehicles that use the Pentastar 3.6, uh, you've are probably aware of this issue or you're about to be because it's super common um, it just doesn't need to be like it shouldn't I shouldn't be going into the engine and replacing all the valve lash adjusters and whatever parts they had to replace in there at 68 69 70 thousand miles it's kind of crazy my buddy Jim has had this done twice to his Wrangler already now he's got a few more miles than I have um, but it's just something that I think is a design flaw in the engine um, it is not the same design as the classic Chevy v8 lifter knock that you hear a lot um, but it's similar it's a similar issue and it involved pulling the heads on both sides and going in and really uh, replacing some significant parts in there uh, and i had that work done and it was around three grand i don't remember the exact cost but around three thousand dollars so it's not a cheap thing and it's something that you really just basically need to plan on if you're going to be owning a wrangler with the pentastar engine long term. That's really the main things uh, from a mechanical standpoint like factory parts. Now currently I don't have a front drive shaft because my Adams 1310 drive shaft, the U-joint at the transfer case uh, came loose, like started knocking a little bit. You could hear it at low speed. It would clunk, 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 clunk. So I pulled that off. Uh, Adams was super fast at getting me the replacement U-joint and the parts for that. Um, I did send them specific measurements for the drive shafts whenever I was lifting the Jeep. Uh, so I don't know, again, if it was an install issue, a measurement issue, or what, because Adams uh, makes a quality product. So I have to think it was maybe not their product that failed. Uh, but, but who knows? Regardless, it doesn't have a front drive shaft right now. That's off on the bench at home. I've got to replace that U-joint and get it back in. Uh, so that's kind of another repair item I've had to have on my list with the Wrangler recently. Let's talk about some of the things that have held up super well. I think the probably the thing that stands out the most because I've been running 37s on the Jeep for the last two years is the stock steering pump. I am running completely stock steering uh, as far as the steering box, the pump, the uh, linkage up to the steering wheel itself. Um, obviously, I have the one-ton tie rod and drag link, but uh, the steering box itself is stock. And I think that's pretty impressive with the amount of wheeling I've done with this thing, with these big tires. Um, sure, when I'm on the rocks, I kind of just let it do its thing. I don't try to fight it and control it because there's really no use. It doesn't have enough power to overpower the, you know, an obstacle if you're wedged up on something, you know, it's just not going to turn. So I try to go easy on the steering and not fight it when I'm off-road, um, which I think has helped prolong its, its life a little bit. But still, pretty impressive that the stock box is still kicking and uh, it really hasn't held me back from any of the obstacles and stuff that I've done on the trail. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool. Another thing that's held up really well are the axles, the stock axles front and rear. It's got the Dana 30 in the front and the Dana 44 in the back. Now I did truss and gusset the Dana 30. More info on that on my how to run 37s uh, safely on your Jeep video, which I'll leave a link to below and on that walk around video that is linked below as well. Um, but yeah, running the stock axles still, which I think also is pretty impressive considering the amount of wheeling I've done over the last two years with 37s and uh, no issues to date. That's a pretty contentious statement. Uh, a lot of people are like, what are you doing running a Dana 30? Uh, if you're that person, you'll like the Gladiator build we're starting because we're doing uh, UD 60s front and rear. And so uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. But anyway, Pretty happy and pretty impressed with the stock axles on this Wrangler Sport uh, so far. You know, some other stuff I could mention that has held up really well, the five-speed transmission, pretty, you know, standard old school five-speed transmission that apparently is used in different platforms, this exact transmission. Uh, some of those platforms have higher horsepower engines than the 3.6, so I think it's kind of an overbuilt transmission for the Wrangler, which probably helps, um, but that 
transmission has held up great and I don't foresee any issues really with it in the near future. Also the factory skid plates that are still in place like the fuel tank skid plate and kind of the one around the, the cross member there in the middle, those have held up uh, really well. Um, they've taken up some hits and I don't really have a need to replace them. Um, all I've done skid plate wise is the primary belly skid uh, from Smittybilt. But yeah, the factory skid plates have held up uh, pretty well and have been impressive in my opinion. Well, in light of all that information, I'd love to hear what your experience has been. If you've owned a Wrangler for a while, drop a comment below and say what issues you've had or what things you've had to replace. I think it'll be helpful for people. But overall, I've been pretty impressed, to be honest. Um, aside from maybe that, you know, those two bigger things, the oil filter housing and the lifter knock, um, I mean, it's really been smooth sailing for four years of some pretty intense wheeling and a lot of daily driving. Um, and having done all the modifications that I've done to it, really no hiccups other than what I just said. So it honestly, in my opinion, it's, it's a pretty reliable vehicle, um, at least in the, these first 72,000 miles. So how does the Wrangler JKU compare to our GX470, which is about an eight year older vehicle? It's actually an older generation of vehicle or the JT, the new Gladiator. Um, how do those three vehicles relate to each other? Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that actually the Wrangler JKU and the GX470 are fairly comparable off-road. Um, I think they're a good kind of comparison because they're very different. Uh, obviously the GX is a Toyota uh, with a V8, not a Jeep with a V6. It's got IFS, the Jeep has a solid axle. Um, the GX has full-time all-wheel drive, set up with sort of a smart center diff situation. Uh, the Jeep is more old school transfer case, um, you know, two wheel drive, four wheel drive, selectable. So there's definite differences, right? But they're both short wheelbase. Um, they're both, because the Lexus is 10 year, almost 10 years older, uh, the tech isn't too far different in them. Um, and they're short wheelbase, like I said, they're really, they come alive off-road. They handle really well off-road. Now, of course, this is not going to be a surprise. The GX is the better vehicle on-road. Uh, it's just a nicer ride without that solid axle in the front. But off-road, the solid axle makes the Jeep a little more stable and uh, it can go over obstacles a lot easier. Uh, the GX did okay. You know, it's got a two and a half inch lift with 33s on Imogene Pass. Uh, there was a few moments where we were three wheeling and I had to back up and hit the obstacle differently, but it made it through just fine. Uh, whereas the Wrangler, you know, in those type of situations, you have to be in some pretty extreme situations uh, to be three wheeling uh, in this Wrangler with three and a half inches of lift and 37s. So again, it's not an apples to apples comparison, uh, but both vehicles have great room inside. The GX has a little bit more room. But the Wrangler's storage room in the back is not bad. I mean, the height with the hardtop is pretty impressive. You can fit a lot in the back of a Wrangler, more than what you would think. Um, and again, they're bo both short wheelbase, both come alive off-road, both make good daily drivers. Um, the GX would be a little bit nicer on road. So that's kind of an interesting comparison. And then the JT, the Gladiator, um, I think the big thing with that is going to be the longer wheelbase and the more difficult departure angle uh, with the, the overhang of the bed. And we've got some things we're going to address with that at some point. But uh, that's going to be the big thing. It's why we're going taller, bigger, stronger than the Wrangler because I want to be able to hit even harder trails than I have in the Wrangler. And in order to do that with the wheelbase difference, you've got to go taller and bigger tires, all that stuff. So the JT, that's going to be what holds it back. Otherwise, it's pretty similar feel to the Wrangler. Um, something with the JT that was interesting and unexpected was the interior cabin feels in some ways almost smaller than the Wrangler. I think the distance between the front seat and the back seat is a little bit less. I could be making it up, I haven't actually measured, but just the feeling inside the JT is, is even a little bit smaller of a cabin um, to me and to my, at least to my radar than the, the Wrangler, uh, which I find a little bit interesting. I wasn't expecting that, um, but the tech in the Gladiator is very welcome. It's a, a very well laid out interior. Uh, so some nice upgrades that JLJT platform has. Uh, inside, which is awesome. Uh, but those are kind of my initial thoughts on how the Wrangler stacks up to those two vehicles. I think overall, the Wrangler JKU is an awesome kind of semi-modern, old-school off-road vehicle that actually works really well as a daily driver, um, but is probably the most capable SUV um, off-road that you can buy. 
Uh, let me know what you thought of this video in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Make sure you're subscribed for all the cool stuff that we talked about earlier coming up on the channel. You don't want to miss it. I'll see you guys soon.